Hello and welcome, uh, Blaine, Ilya, and Eric. Uh, so I'll be the moderator today for the session. I've We've discussed this in advance, so uh, you have some familiarity with the questions, but I'll just uh, kind of start going through the questions and please just share your experiences and insights into uh, the questions around uh, startup mobility. So I'll start off with the first question of, the pandemic has forced everyone to work differently. What do you think would be the situation post pandemic in regards to startups hiring new talent? So the question is really focusing on, will talent come back to work in the offices or will companies prefer to continue to work remotely? I might ask Blaine for his perspective on that first. Yeah, sure. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, you know, I think that's a million dollar question. I think many of us are having right now. We're seeing cities like New York that are driving more people back to the office. Um, you know, there's a bigger thing, bigger factor than just working in the office. There's a whole uh, economies that rely on people going to work. And I think governments know that and understand that. Um, but what we've been seeing in our end is it has been playing a role. Larger companies are still looking at it's definitely steep call, state culture and keep the culture intact, um, you know, with, with in presence office. We've been seeing a little bit more remote work, a uh, balance between the two remote and going into the office has been discussed quite a bit. Smaller organizations and those who are startup scaling, um, I, you know, I'm seeing that, you know, I'm kind of hearing from, from other organizations that they're thinking about going more remote side. Uh, also, the remote workforces that they have internationally before they would want to consider bringing them in-house, you know, getting them to Canada or, you know, their local environment so they can start building on the culture as well. Um, but I guess, you know, that's a million dollar question. We'll wait to see how it really pans out. But I'm a believer that I think we're going to see a hybrid model between uh, a remote and a local. No, great. Thank you, Blaine. Uh, Ilya, do you have something that you'd like to add to that? Uh, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I think it's going to be hybrid. I think it's going to be much more remote, though. Um, I saw an article today where a company wanted everyone to go remotely and all the employees went on strike. Sorry, I wanted to go back to the office and all the employees went on strike. Um, so I just, it's just a way better model. So I, I don't think people will be going to the office very much. Great. Thank you. And Eric? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with um, with Blaine and Ilya, and I think um, you know, from a startup perspective, especially, there's going to be a return to the office because in the incubators and accelerators, really mixing with all the other companies and startups there is, is a big thing, and it's a big part of the programs. Um, in the big offices, I think the blended model will work, but I, I I can see a lot of startups returning back to those those office spaces. Great, thank you all for your insight into that. Um, now let's focus to looking at the startups themselves. So for startups that are looking to access the North American market, uh, do you think they will they will need to be in market in the North American market, or will they be able to access the North American market from their home countries? I might start off with uh, Ilya. Uh, yeah, I don't think you need to be physically in any location to do business in that country. Um, maybe it'll help, but the advantage is a lot less than it used to be. Uh, we have customers all over the world, and we don't have people in those countries, and most sales we do are on the computer. So. I don't think you need to be in the country. We, we have US customers and we're not in the US. Thank you, Ilya. Looking, moving on to Eric. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Ilya there. And it's it's easy today, especially to be selling into other countries with software solutions um, sitting at home. Um, I think for, for business development in particular, it's always, it's never bad to be able to go to another country and meet somebody face to face and have that familiarity, but it's uh, it definitely doesn't hinder progress to, to be sitting at home on Zoom. Great, well, thank you, Eric. Uh, listen, <laughs> no. I'm, just gonna, I, I'm not gonna agree with this one just because of the hell of it. We can't agree at every point. So let me be a devil's <laughs> advocate and say, I don't agree with that necessarily. I think it has a lot to do with the cost or the, the total value of what it is that you're, let, let's say sales perspective. Um, you know, I was a former sales executive. I worked corporate sales for quite some time. I value an in-person relationship. Also, when we're talking about different countries, the importance of being involved, at least in the continent, understanding how those businesses work, how the ecosystem is, what's the daily traffic like, you know, understanding the little, the little whims of that country helps you be more of an effective person in delivering solutions or software or knowing how to build to that market. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the entire uh, value prop. If you're selling a, a subscription for twenty nine ninety nine a month or something, and uh, you know you're selling for maybe under two three thousand dollars a year, uh, sorry a month, that's fine. But if you're trying to sell a quarter of a million dollar solution or you know up there, you know you really need that face to face, maybe that golf outing. Um, and now to Ilya's point and 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 
to make that you don't necessarily need to be in that country you could just travel but I definitely think that there's a difference between working remotely if you're a software developer, perhaps, but if you're trying to get a startup off the ground and you want to go into a market, I do believe that you really need to kind of be in that environment. You need to understand a little bit more of the ins and outs of that um, environment. And though the gentlemen do make great points, uh, I, I do concur with many of them. I'm just playing a devil's advocate, and my previous sales experience tells me that an in-person approach is still a valuable approach. And one thing that I've been uh, noticing is you're going to have two types of salespeople now, I notice. The person who wants to go with the virtual meetings and that other person is going to take that extra step. And by the way, that budget's no longer there for that travel expense like it was before. You know, they're going to, maybe that's going to be the difference between winning a deal and losing a deal is the person who comes and sits down and shakes my hand versus the person who turns on their screen. No, that's a great perspective, uh, Blaine. Ilya or Eric, do you want to uh, add or anything to that? Sure, I'll go. If I may, then, um, you know, I think it's interesting, interesting point. Um, we've been able to sell from Canada and when we do sell pretty large solutions with my company, but we are also playing with the idea of not relocating salespeople to other countries, but just hiring within those countries now because we can operate internally on Zoom and, and have those people kind of represent us. But I mean, there's challenges in that as well, right? And then hiring people like that and setting up satellite offices all around the world. Um, but uh, I guess we'll see how that plays out as well. Yeah, there's a good solution you can use. Uh, there's a few of them, uh, deal, remote, etc., that can help you set with payroll and contractors for, for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think, Glenn, you're right in the fact that you need to know the country and the market you're selling into. Like, I get a lot of cold calls from people who clearly aren't in Canada or don't really understand the Canadian ecosystem, um, and they're, they never work. Um, so I think if you have someone who maybe isn't here but understands the local market, takes the time and, and studies, et cetera, that you, you can do that. Uh, but it's it's a trade-off, right? Like, um, it, no no one can sell to that person better than someone from that same culture, or you know, on average. Uh, but you also want to trade off, like have a, have a trade-off. If you're if you're a startup from I don't know some uh, a country from South America, Latin America, hiring a U.S. Uh, salesperson is going to be pretty expensive. So how can you? You know, have that trade off in the early days, especially to be able to have success. Uh, it's not easy. No, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good discussion. On to the next question. Um, I might ask. Uh, I might ask Eric to offer his perspective first. Into uh, it's a pretty broad question, but what would you think are the challenges and opportunities around mobilizing talent and companies post pandemic? Uh, I mean, I think going back to the the, the previous two questions. Um, and it's costly to to have your workforce move or, or travel to other locations, of course, right? And especially for, I'll go again from a startup perspective, that's that's quite a bit of money that we can save and, and pour into other resources. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, Blaine's not wrong, right? Having a, a, a salesperson physically on the ground in other countries selling for you that knows the market, um, it does make sense in a lot of different ways. Um, so I think it's just at that point. I mean, again, to Blaine's point, you weigh the cost benefit, right? And, and you, I think, I think it's a case by case decision that you have to make in each country that way. Great. Uh, what are your perspectives on that, uh, Blaine? No, like, listen, it's absolutely case by case. I think there's going to be a new level of experimenting that's going to be happening. Uh, happening. Um, I think companies are going to look at budgets in a different way. They're going to, it, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. Like travel, expense, entertainment plays a decent role in most businesses' line items. Depends on what they're doing, what they're selling. Um, but it's going to be like you know, even from my perspective, even in our company, what we do at Bright, you know, I, we were assessing, you know, where do we allocate these savings? How do we pivot? How do we make it work? Um, and but it is an experiment. We don't know if it's going to be that effective or not. You know. Having a, a great office and a great presence, you know, it does yield re revenue. Now the question is, is could I pivot that revenue outside of that and put it into other areas with the hopes that it will generate not just more revenue, but also all of the indirect benefits, not just always money. Sometimes it's reputation. Sometimes referral businesses may be lacking if it's not more personal. There might be a lot of indirect revenues you haven't recognized that you may be losing out on. So I just think it's going to be a whole very large experiment like COVID has forced many of us to to be or to go into is experimenting but yeah and Ilya, is there anything that you would like to add 
Yeah, I think it could potentially be like a, like a big differentiator if you are able to do that, like um, because no, not many people are doing it. So if you're able to um, spend money, fly, do something, you know, with that in-person aspect, it might make an even bigger impact um, than than otherwise. Uh, so, yeah, maybe if if you can do it, it could it, it could be a uh, something to to help you stand out and close some deals. Right. And just one thing I want to add to that point is know your customer very well, know your target audience. I know that's obvious speaking to the startup community, but you know a lot of startup companies are building great innovative solutions, but they're still selling to a, a, you know an old school industry or a generational industry that you know that their their decision maker might not be so inclined in 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 uh, Zoom meetings. Will really value that person in face to face. So one thing is if you're looking, especially at the big ticketed items know who's making that decision know what it is that they do try to judge is it worth paying that you know two to three thousand dollar expenditure for travel all around or is it better that you know we do it digitally so that would probably be another takeaway i would have for any startup book itself well and if well, I, sorry if i can just add quick like we so i love that point because uh, before we we dive into a new market, we engage with like trade commissioners, we engage with consulting firms. You pour a little bit of money in and see is it worth it to implement an entire team there, or can you just do it virtually, or even just leave it alone for the time being, right? But I I, yeah, I like that point a lot. Great. So I, I think we can definitely uh, agree that there's we need to do the costs and benefits of going into the new market. And just in our last minute of the session, are there any big are there any major takeaways that you would provide for advice to uh, kind of startups that are in, that are looking looking at different markets during this time, um, kind of pandemic and post-pandemic. Uh, Blaine, I'll start with you. Any advice for us? Well, right off the bat, if you're a Canadian business, you have payroll, government has been really ha like helping you kind of stabilize, take advantage of that, right? Take advantage of the cost savings, take advantage of the opportunity to hire people that you know you could try and experiment. I think that's key to any business, especially in this market. Excellent advice. Uh, Eric? Uh, I think you know we're set to see I think they called it the next boom because we've been in, in, in our cave in COVID for so long. And I think businesses need to still move with some caution and not just go running out the gates and, and try and grab everything that they can. There still needs to be a degree of validation to every single thing you do. And uh, Ilya, final words of advice. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just keeping with the human element. Um, a lot of times you're, you're online, it's hard to, to really make a connection. So if you can find something about the person, make a connection to, on a human level, it will make a difference. No, excellent. Uh, words of advice from the experts. Thank you guys so much for uh, for joining me on the panel and uh, thanks for sharing your expertise and insight into uh, impacts of pandemics on the startup mobility. So thank you.